All right, so the title of my sermon this morning is The Gift of Speaking with Tongues. And of course, we started off in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 describes the day of Pentecost. Verse number 1 actually starts off to saying, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And of course, this is happening immediately, essentially immediately after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, there's the, the Gospels, and of course, John is the last one before the book of Acts, but you got all the accounts of the Gospels ending with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and then the resurrection. And then in the book of Acts, we see a little bit more uh, about Jesus Christ, you know, uh, being resurrected and sending him out, and they pick a new uh, disciple. And then we, we end up with the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost was a special day where we had a lot of people, Jews from all over the world, essentially, would come to worship on at this time, at this day. And this is important to understand. It's not like you need to go and study some extra biblical material and learn that people did this. The Bible tells us this. I mean, this is, this is very plain and simple to see. You can see all throughout the book of Acts that the Apostle Paul even wanted to be in Jerusalem, you know, when, when you're having these, these big gatherings. And uh, there's a lot going on here. And the reason why I even take the time to, to sort of point that out is because there is a purpose for the gift that was given of God of people speaking with tongues. And before I even get into all of that, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, I want to just kind of define biblically what tongues is, what, it, what is tongue. We, you know, people will use this speaking with tongues these days to, to define it differently or somewhat differently. The, they, I think most people will still say you're speaking in a language which that's what the word tongue literally just means. But it's been warped and perverted into just, if someone says you're speaking with tongues, it's automatically just some language that nobody knows. Right? Today, the, the Pentecostals, as they you know, refer to themselves, because of this day of Pentecost, that's, that's where their, their denominational name comes from, because they believe in, this, in their doctrine of speaking in tongues that, uh, that is not the biblical speaking with tongues that we see here, but it's their own sideshow circus type of event that is literally of Satan and is not of the Holy Spirit. And I have no qualms saying that publicly and preaching that and being very hard preaching about that, even though, and, and see, you know, people who don't understand and don't know, you could, you know, if you, and if you didn't know, you shouldn't say things like that because the Bible says the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is an unforgivable sin. And people were doing that to Jesus when they were saying that the things that Jesus was doing was of Satan and not of the Holy Ghost. So saying that whatever is being done is of the devil and is not of God when people are claiming that it's of God, you got to be make sure that you're right about that so that you're not in danger of, of doing what people, what the Pharisees were doing about Jesus Christ. Now, like I said before, I have zero doubt and no qualms about just publicly condemning the, the charismatic Pentecostal movement and their fake speaking in tongues because it literally is of the devil. And I believe that the people who are actually doing that, that aren't faking it, because most of them are faking it, you talk to people who come out of those movements and they're like, yeah, we, you know, they just want to do what other people are doing. They want to look spiritual too. And they fake it. And they, they work themselves up to try to get themselves in a state of mind to be able to, oh, I spoke in tongues too. But they have this culture that says, well, you know, basically they'll question your salvation if you're not speaking in tongues. I had people come up to me out soul winning before and say, well, so, but do you speak in tongues? You know, and they just want to sound all spiritual and holier than now and everything else. Because, well, I speak in tongues. Do you even speak in tongues? It's like I'm out preaching the gospel and they want to, you know, bring bring that up and, and whatever. Right. So. But, you know, they believe you could lose your salvation. They believe a lot of other, you know, they basically believe a works based salvation, which is why we know for 100 percent for sure they're not of God. And if people aren't even saved, you know, they're not getting poured out this gift of the spirit that the Bible talks about. Now. In the book of Acts, in verse number four here, we'll just read, starting verse number one, 
Bible says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. So this is obviously a very special event that's happening right here. And this is the first time that we see anybody receiving this gift of being able to speak with other tongues. So the church is kind of gathered together here in one place. All of a sudden there's this, this rushing, the sound of a rushing mighty wind, right? So it's kind of like the place that they're in is just um, obviously being, being filled with that Holy Spirit and, and it sounds like this mighty wind coming in. And then they see, they appear cloven. Cloven means they're split, like these split tongues that looks like fire and just kind of rests or sits on each of them. I don't know exactly what that would look like. I mean, we, this, is, this is the information that we have, but it's, it's kind of like maybe a, I mean, uh, an apparition sort of, like a, like a tongue that's split and, and fiery. I don't know. But uh, this, is, this is what we see happening here. And then it says in verse number four, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So what's happening here then is now they're able to speak with another tongue. And what is the Bible talking about when it says they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance? Look at verse number five. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So in verse number four, it says they began to speak with other tongues. And in verse number six, it says every man heard them speak in his own language. And it takes very, very little knowledge and understanding to know that the word tongue means language. It's very commonly used even outside of the Bible. You know, I, I'm not going to spend my time just completely proving that, but we can see it clearly even in context here. When they were speaking with other tongues, people hear them in a language. So that's all it means. And it says in verse number seven, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one another, behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? So why were people kind of freaked out? Like, what in the world is going on? It's because everybody that was speaking with these other languages and people were hearing them speak in other languages, the people who were doing the speaking, they're all just from Galilee. They're all Galileans. And it said earlier in verse 5, there was dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So every nation of the world is represented in Jerusalem at this time. And every nation, you know, different nations have different languages. And people, even the devout Jews, you know, they're living there. Many of them were probably raised in other countries. Even though they're devout Jews, they, they make a trek back to worship as they, you know, for Pentecost, but they're still spending their life and their time out there. And many of these Jews probably don't even speak Hebrew. Maybe they don't speak, you know, whatever languages, we don't know what they, what they speak, but they know their own language. These people are starting to speak, regardless of how many languages they do speak. When the Spirit gave utterance to those that were given this gift of speaking with tongues, the people hearing them, heard in their own language, their own language, the language from their native tongue, where they were born, where they're from. They're starting to hear them speak and they're like, how do they know that language, right? I mean, they're all just from here in Galilee. What, what are they, how is it that they know all these languages? So it was a miracle. They, they had no, and they didn't know, it's not that they all studied right before the day of Pentecost, right after Jesus resurrected and now they're going to learn all these languages. This is supernatural. That's why it talks about the cloven tongues resting upon them. And they were able to speak in language they didn't know. Verse number eight says, and how hear we every man in our own tongue? So again, verse six says they heard them in their own language. And then verse eight, we hear them in our own tongue. It's being used interchangeably. There's no, no difference there. But see, because we don't as commonly today say tongue, 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 we say language when we're referring to someone's language. It adds a little bit more of a mystery to it, to the ignorant, to the people who just don't know any better. So that way we say, oh, but do you speak in tongues? It's easier to get away with false doctrine with words that are not as commonly used today as they were back when the Bible was translated in English.
So same thing with, um, you know, repent. It's just not as, as, as commonly used, and it's easier to get away with some false doctrine and add meaning to it or change meaning of it or whatever um, to try to redefine the word, just like the people who believe in, this, in, in the speaking of tongues. I'm talking about the Pentecostals with, the, with their literal babbling. That is not another language. It's just gibberish. It's nothing. And they'll claim it's just another language. We just don't know what the language is. I mean, I could stand up in here and go, oh, but you know, and just make a bunch of sounds and noises come out of my mouth. You'd be like, Pastor Burgess, that's not a real language. I'm like, yes, it is. You just don't know it. <laughs> and how do you refute that, right? And you say, well, nobody knows it. It's an unknown language. It's an angelic. The angels know what I'm saying. And, and they, they, they set it up so it's like, well, how could you even, you know, there's, there's no way you could disprove that if someone's just making that claim. It's like, okay, well, no, it's not. Yes, it is. You know, whatever. And the people who fall for this stuff, it's sad, it's unfortunate, but, you know, there's a desire oftentimes in people to have their, their religion or their faith just feel real. And unfortunately, you know, the Bible talks about faith as being the evidence of, of, of things that are not seen. So like we have trust, we have faith in Jesus Christ, we have faith in the Bible, we have faith in the Word of God, you can't prove those things visually. We can see it, we can hear it, we can understand, we can reason, we can, we can study it out and look at it and determine, yes, this is reasonable to have faith in this, this is the truth, it makes sense, there's no contradiction. You know, you, you, could, you could come to a faith ultimately based on the Word of God, but we don't need anything else to provide that faith for us. And for some people, they can't just put their faith in the Word of God. They need something else to prove to them that this is real. And they want to hold to that. And that's, you know, there's a lot of very superstitious people out there in the world too. And they like to be able to, lead, to rest on being able to see some things that are supernatural or try to believe in that because they see it as opposed to just trusting in the truth because it's the truth. And, and that's kind of how people fall for this, is they'll walk into a church and they'll see people like, oh man, what is going on here? And then they're claiming, oh yeah, this is just like, and you remember I was just talking about how the book of Acts is my, last week I preached a sermon, the book of Acts is my favorite book of the Bible, I love all the excitement and stuff in there. And you know what, yeah, it would be cool to be able to speak other languages and stuff, but when I was talking about this being my favorite book and I was talking about all the Acts and stuff, that's not what I was referring to at all about being able to do that even today. I just liked all the excitement of all the work they were doing and the soul winning and, the, you know, and, and just how many people were just on fire, sold out, you know, not one foot in the world, one foot in church, but just completely all in and doing the work of the Lord. That's exciting. And that's what makes it my favorite book. Yes, these other things are cool too. Like it's, it's, it's really interesting to read about this and see what was going on. And the fact that people had this, this miraculous gift to be able to speak in another language that they, don't, that they themselves don't know. But that's not really what I'm looking for is to be able to do all of that now. And we're going to get into 1 Corinthians 14 later. That describes how the, you know, the kind of an order of the spiritual gifts that were given and things like that. And how speaking in tongues or with other tongues is not, um, is not like at the top either. Far from it. But um, I digress here. So we see here in verse number eight, we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. And then it, notice this in verse nine, it lists off where they're from. The Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and in Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. First thing I want to point out about this in, in contrast to what you would hear from a Pentecostal church is that there are people here that are understanding exactly what's being said. Not people claiming to be an interpreter and going, oh yeah, I know what he said. No, literal people that said, no, this is the language of my birth. This is the language of my home country where I'm from, from Arabia. This is from my, my, my country in Cappadocia. This is from where I grew up in Pontus. This is, you know, the, they're speaking my language. I could hear, I'm understanding exactly what they're saying. 
this is biblical speaking with other tongues. This is what it was. And guess what? The reason is so that they could be understood. That's the whole purpose is that there's this gospel to be preached of the resurrection of Jesus Christ about the Savior who came and died and rose again from the dead that the world needs to hear. And God is sending them out into all the world to preach the gospel. And you have this great opportunity that the resurrection of Jesus Christ just so happened immediately before the day of Pentecost where people were already going to be coming to that place and completely prepared to hear the gospel to be able to bring it back home to their native land. I mean, you want to talk about getting a head start and getting the gospel sent out to all the world. You take an event where people are already joined together that are already these Jews that were, you know, I believe most of them were probably believers, right? Many of them. Either way, if they weren't, they, had, they, they needed to hear you know, where they were in error on their religion and hear, hey, the Savior came and here's what happened. And even though they live real far away, they're able to receive the truth and then bring that truth back home. In addition to the disciples or the apostles being sent out into the world, you have people who came in, now they can bring it out as well too. It makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense to God to give them this miracle. It makes perfect sense that this happened and you can see the exact purpose for the gift given on the day of Pentecost for the disciples at that time. Now turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Because these are the two main places that we're going to see teaching on this subject. And this is going to be more of a Bible study this morning because we're pretty much going to go through all of 1 Corinthians 14 because the entire chapter basically is dedicated to kind of this topic and this subject. And I preached on it last week and I had mentioned that I wasn't going to talk about this then, but that's why I'm talking about it now because it is an important subject. It's an important doctrine to understand and not to be shaken uh, or waver on the truth of what the Bible teaches about this because there are charlatans out there. There are people out there that if you're unstable, they may shake your faith and be like, well, I don't know, maybe that's the real religion because they're doing this and you can see it, right? You can see them doing this stuff and, and they're putting on this big show. But I'll tell you what, you know, the, the Bible tells us that things will be done decently in order and that the house of God shouldn't be a circus. Amen. You go to these Pentecostal churches, it's like a circus. Okay, it doesn't start off that way necessarily, but they hype it up and they got the music ramping and then before you know it, people are standing up and they're shouting out and they're just doing, all, you know, it's like, it gets scary real fast for the saved person or the normal person. Like, what is going on here? And 1 Corinthians 14 should just, if, if you think that's of God, read 1 Corinthians 14 and compare that with the church service and these Pentecostal church services and be like, well, that's not right. 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 They're not doing that right. Not... All of a sudden, it's starting to look like maybe this isn't of God. For people who are supposed to be so holy and so spiritual and everything else that they're speaking in tongues, they can't seem to follow the chapter that talks about speaking in tongues. And that, you know, that's their focus, too. You know, just like the Jehovah's Witness, they focus on what's the name of God? What's the name of God? What, you know, it's like all they want to talk about. Well, these Pentecostals, it's the speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues. You speak in tongues? And some are worse than others. You got all different variety and brands of this. But the ones who, who cling the most to that, that's what they really want to talk about. Because for them, it's, a, it's, it's like a sign for them that they're right and you're wrong. That, well, I speak with tongues. Or even just that they're saved. Like, well, I know I'm saved because I speak with tongues or whatever. And it's a lie. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 14. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. And, I, and I'm thinking about going through some of the other spiritual gifts that, that God gives through the Holy Spirit. There's other gifts. And the Bible's telling us here, and just in verse number one, you know, desire spiritual gifts. It's a good thing to desire spiritual gifts, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But just right from the beginning, he's saying, but rather that you may prophesy. Prophesy is preaching. Right? Preach the Word of God, that you, could, that you can expound the Word of God and prophesy and help people through preaching. You know, 
focus on that more than these other spiritual gifts that you can receive of the Holy Ghost. Verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edify at the church. So right off the bat, it's making this distinction between, okay, if you had the opportunity right now to be able to speak with another tongue, if God gave you that gift of being able to speak in another language and you're able to do that. Now, I just, and think about this. This is, this is natural. I mean, he's, he's talking to the church of Corinth. We're the church of Norcross, okay? We're, we're looking at a group of people who you know, by and large, most people only speak one language here. Some speak two. I don't know if there's anyone here that speaks three languages. Maybe, may, maybe, right? But that's it. And if you had the gift of speaking with other tongues, I mean, if I just started speaking Chinese right now, I mean, is there anyone here that speaks Chinese? How about Arabic? But having the gift of speaking another tongue would allow me to be able to, to think whatever I want to say, but when I start to speak, I'd be speaking in that tongue that I hadn't learned, but miraculously through the Spirit, I was able to speak those things. And by the way, the gift from the Holy Spirit of speaking in tongues isn't a gift that's given just through study like, oh, well, I'm just good at, at learning languages. This was a gift for people who didn't know the language. Anybody can study and learn other languages. Anybody can do it. You put enough time in. This is a miracle. You wouldn't need a cloven tongue resting on people if it was just based on their own studies. And well, God just gave them a talent and an aptitude to do it. No, this is a, this is an act, this is a miracle. And look, I believe in God giving people talents and aptitudes to do different things and skills and things and some people are better at things than others. But when the Bible's talking about spiritual gifts, gifts of the Holy Ghost, like the gift of healing, the gift of healing is not you're a doctor. So you're able to help people. That's not the gift of healing. The gift of healing was a miraculous gift that like the Apostle Paul is just over in some foreign country and some guy's real sick and he's able to lay hands on him and he recovers. He's not doing, you know, some Eastern or Western medicine or anything like that. That's just learn and be like, oh, yeah, I learned this back in, in Pharisee school that when someone has this, I just give them this root or give them this herb or whatever to heal them. That's not what he's doing. The Holy Ghost is healing those people because it's a spiritual gift. Amen. And similarly, the gift of tongues was a spiritual gift that was given to people who didn't study the language to learn the language. They just, you know, in a sense, knew it, but really it's the Holy Ghost doing the translating for them and helping them to, to speak with that language. It's a gift. So if I were to stand up here today and just preach this entire sermon in Arabic, I would edify nobody but myself. I would be able to speak to God. Now, obviously, we have the internet here, so maybe someone else out there would be able to be edified by it, but... You all, who is our church, would not receive anything from it. You'd be sitting there going, when is this going to be over? <laughs> You'd be looking at the time going like, no idea what he's saying. It might be kind of cool for a couple minutes if I just start, if you just start hearing me speak some other language, but that would fade real fast. Be like, I came here to learn. I didn't come here to <laughs> just listen to, I, I, I didn't, I, I'm not going to church in Arabia. I'm going to church in Norcross in Georgia. Right, I want to hear you speak English. And ultimately, yeah, I could prop myself up like, well, I got the gift of speaking with other tongues. Good for you. But that doesn't help anybody if, unless they understand that language. And when the Bible says here an unknown language, it's unknown to those around you. It doesn't mean it's just unknown by everybody in the entire world. It's unknown to those in audible range. People who are gathered together to hear. And that becomes more and more obvious as we get through chapter 14 because it's talking about the church. It's talking about how things would be done in church. 
So that's where people are gathered together, speaking an unknown tongue. Yeah, I know what I'm saying. If I have the gift of speaking another tongue, I know what I'm saying because I know what I'm trying to say and what I want to say. And the words are just coming out in a different language. So I know what I'm saying and God knows what I'm saying. But no one else does. And that's why he's saying, like, instead of seeking after that, why don't you seek after prophesying? Because that, the person who is able to prophesy, they're prophesying in their own language, which is what everyone here understands. And my native tongue is English. And for mo I know not for everyone that's their native tongue, but for most people, that's their native tongue here. But everyone here is able to speak English and understand English, so you're going to receive edifying by the preaching and the prophesying because we, we all speak the same language. I mean, it makes sense, right? I'm going to move on from that point because that's just, I mean, it, it's so simple. It's so simple. It's like, how could anyone not see that? But there's tons of people that don't. There's tons of people that fall for this false doctrine. Verse number four says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that y'all spake with tongues. So he's saying, it'd be great if y'all spake with tongues. That would be nothing wrong with that. He doesn't, he's not trying to prevent them from receiving the spiritual gift. He says, but rather that you prophesied. He says, better if you're all able to prophesy than if y'all spake with tongues. He's like, great, I'd be, I'd be happy if y'all had that gift, but... I'd be even happier, it'd be even better if you were able to prophesy. He says, uh, for great, greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So unless there's someone to able to, you know, like, it's greater just to be able to prophesy, to preach, than it is to speak with other tongues, unless you're able to actually get the translation. Someone can interpret, give the translation. Great, oh, okay, that's what you're saying. Now we can all be edified by that. And I, you know, I told you about the guy that approached me out soul winning and he was just like, yeah, but do you speak in tongues? I'm out here prophesying. I'm preaching the cross of Jesus Christ and the Bible says that's greater than you being able to, to babble and, and open up your mouth and speak things that you don't even know what you're saying. And that's another key difference between the Pentecostal movement and what the, what the apostles did and what the disciples did that had the gift of speaking with other tongues is that when they speak with, with speaking tongues, so-called, they don't know what they're saying. The people doing the speaking don't know what they're saying. They just think it's of God. Oh, well, Holy Ghost is just saying it. Well, you know, there's a problem with that. The problem with that, look to, jump down to verse number 32, and we're going to get to this in order, but... The Bible says in verse 32 here of chapter 14, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. The, so, you know, the Holy Spirit and the gifts of, of being able to speak in other tongues is still ultimately subject to the person. You're still in control. You're still in the driver's seat. You know what you want to say. Your words can be coming out, you know, and, and being translated in this other language but you're still in control. You can choose not to speak or you can choose to speak. And you're choosing what to say. As the Holy Ghost uses you and works through you, it's still, you're still the one in charge. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Subject means under your control, under your authority. And that is the way that, that God works is that God doesn't just possess people and just make them say whatever it is. He can lead them and guide them and give them utterance, but you have to yield yourself to that. You can't just, you're not just ever controlled and taken over in that sense. But you know who does do that? Satan does that. And I'm not going to go through all the examples right now, but you see the examples in Scripture, especially if you go to the book of Mark, out of all the books of the Bible, you go to the book of Mark, you'll find the most examples of people being possessed with devils. And they're always plaguing them. And there's, there's things that, you know, the people can't do anything against them. Like the, the, the devil just possess them and they end up doing things that they wouldn't normally do because the devil's making them do it. Whoever, however they're being possessed. Like the legion that was in the one guy, I mean, he's cutting himself and screen, you know, and doing all this stuff and living among the, the tombs. He's out of his mind. 
and he was saying things and doing, you know, he had people, he was speaking in a sense with another tongue when the legion was talking, but he wasn't controlling that. And that's what's happening. And that's what I believe when the people, because there's some people that are involved in the Pentecostal movement that will testify, you know, when that happens, they black out. They don't really know what happened. Someone else has to tell them. And they'll be saying things, and some of them will sound like they are speaking in, in an actual language. And I believe that, it, that very well could be an actual language, but that's of the devil. The devil is able to reproduce and mimic some of the things that are of God. And this is proved back in Job. You can see where Satan was attacking Job, and he was causing these supernatural type of event types of events that happen against Job like where fire came down from heaven was one of the things that happened and then the whirlwind came and destroyed the house where his where his children were at you know these are things that you would think that only God can do those things but the devil is able to reproduce those things to some extent right and be able to show and even you know even Pharaoh's magicians were able to reproduce some of the things some of the miracles that Aaron and Moses were doing. And again, not necessarily to the same extent. There were some things they just weren't able to do. They weren't able to bring forth life. They weren't able to, to just cause the lies to come, but they were able to reproduce some of the other things. They were able to, to make their rods become serpents, you know, whatever. Like there, was, there were some things that they were capable of doing, and that was not the power of God. So, you know, the devil is... is is slick you know he's he's a con man so he's trying to look like he has the power of god when he really doesn't and this this where people become possessed and they speak with other languages isn't you know you, you got to look deeper what are they saying what's going on how is it happening before you just assume that that's of god and that you know what the, when the, when they're doing it they're being taken over they're being controlled they're not in the driver's seat and this, the, the, the spirit of the prophets, the so-called prophets there, is not subject to the prophets. It's not of God. But let's go back to, um, just up further in this passage. I want to read through some more of this. Verse number six. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. And he's likening words and people speaking things with just instruments, right? Musical instruments. Anyone can go to the piano and go, and it makes a sound. But you're not going to be able to sing along to a tune and, and sing a hymn if someone just does that. You need to hear the melody. You need to hear them played in a particular order, a particular fashion, in a way that makes sense. You're like, oh yeah, I know this. This makes sense to me. I know what I'm supposed to do now. I know where we're at in the song. I know the words. I know what to sing because it was designed and put together and made sense, right? And the same thing if you have a, you know, an army and you're doing a battle sound with a trumpet. There's different signals that were given for armies that they would use. One maybe for, for retreat, one for a charge, one for to gather people together, to relay, you know, all these different signals they would use, but you had to make the sound right so that people know, oh, okay, that's what that means. They've already been trained. They already know what it means in advance. And language is the same thing. If you're going to speak and utter words, well, people are going to have to understand what the language means and what, what the language is in order for it to be meaningful. He's saying otherwise you're just speaking into the air. Otherwise, you just got words coming out. How is it, how shall it be known what is spoken? And then verse number 10 says, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, 
I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. He's saying, it's going to be like a barbarian. Like, I don't know what you're saying. I have no idea. Verse 12, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. He brings it up again. I know that you're zealous. I know you want to have these spiritual gifts. It's cool, right? It's amazing. It's a great miracle. But seek that ye may edify the church. Because it's not about you, it's about them. That's the whole mindset. And the whole purpose of the spiritual gift is not to lift yourself up and show how spiritual you are. It's to help edify other people. So how is the Pentecostal tongue speaking edifying to anybody at all when no one understands what you're saying? Answer, it's not. The reason why people do is because they're trying to lift themselves up and make themselves look more spiritual. Say, oh man, yeah, I was really speaking, I was really filled with the Spirit this morning, huh, brother? Do you see how much I was speaking in tongues? Or, you know, no, you're closer to the devil. <laughs> or you're faking it. And, and the, the, the fraud thing is very, I've talked to many people, especially, you know, people grow up with this. And people do a lot of things to try to fit in and make themselves part of the in crowd in a group setting, especially in a church. They're going to look around, they're going to learn and say, okay, this is what people are doing. And I've had people say, you know, I tried and tried and tried to speak with tongues, but I just couldn't. And it's like, well, that's part of the problem too. You're trying to speak with tongues. Look, it's a spiritual gift that's given. It's not your own effort that's going to make you be able to speak with tongues as a spiritual gift. You want to speak with another tongue, learn the language, right? You can pray to God for the spiritual gift, but you know, if there's not a purpose for it, if there's not a use, then why would he even, I don't even see why he would give it out. And you know, I, I may or may not preach on this, so I'll just say it now anyways, you know, it's regarding spiritual gifts in general. We see, you know, there's a lot of spiritual gifts that were given right at the time after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Huge amount of miracles being done. Unseen in history prior to and even after that. We do see some miracles, those similar miracles are the same miracles done in the Old Testament prior to that, but it wasn't with the same magnitude of how many people were doing it, how many miracles were being performed way more regularly than had been done in the past. And I think the reason for that is there was more of a reason for the miracles to be done than in the past. Now, when there's a need or a reason to have a miraculous event, God does it. God will perform it. God will give you that power. God will give you that spiritual gift. But when the need doesn't really exist, why, why make the miracle happen? You know, it's just it, for what value? For what purpose? To what intent? And God comes through on those needs, not just the whims of a person that just says, well, I want to speak in tongues. Okay, but for what purpose? Now, I do believe that God's capable of, of giving these spiritual gifts to people today, even though you, you know, we're not seeing that happen very regularly. We don't need to just say, oh, well, because I don't see it happening in your church, then you must not be of God. No, and and you know what? I'm not going to go there. I, I'll probably end up. I'll probably end up going there next week, because they they'll turn to Mark 16 and say, "Oh, see, look, if you're you know you're not saved unless you're doing all these things," but that's a that's a lie out of hell. Um, let's keep going over this tongues thing because there's so much still continuing here. Uh, Verse 12 again, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to, ed to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So if God's giving you a gift and you're speaking in a tongue that people don't know, then just pray that God's going to help you be able to interpret that as well so that other people can get the learning. He says, and it says in verse 14, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So if you're starting to pray in a tongue that even you don't know, he's saying, my understanding is unfruitful. God's still going to know what I'm saying, but I don't even know what I'm saying. And he's saying that that's, you know, verse 15, what is it then? Well, you know, well, I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. 
And what I want to point about this, there's, there's actually people out there, I've run into people in the past that say, no, 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 we, you know, we, we follow 1 Corinthians 14 and stuff, so we don't have, you know, our church is done decently in order, but they still believe in the speaking in tongues nonsense. And, and they're, they're the Bapticostals, that they're Baptists, but they still have this, this weird, you know, Pentecostal influence on their church, and there's kind of a mix of Pentecostal and Baptist are the ones that I've seen that, that, that are a little bit better at following this, but it's still just completely wrong. And the ones I come up with, they're still unsaved, you know, or they're just completely faking it. But, I mean, the ones that I meet, they're, they're believing you could lose your salvation and stuff. Anyone who's got the Pentecostal influence seems to have that uh, go along with it. And I've had them say, you know, I don't, uh, I don't just, you know, shout out in church, but you know what? I do pray with tongues. You know, when I'm by myself in my prayer closet or whatever, I do pray with tongues. Like, well, the Bible says here that if you're going to pray, like, do you understand what you're saying? What language are you speaking? Do you even know anything about it? And, you know, if you're not, if you don't even know what you're saying, that's unfruitful. The Apostle Paul says, I'm going to pray with the Spirit and with the understanding. So I'm, not, I'm just not going to do it. And you know what that also shows you? It's subject to the Apostle Paul. So if he, knows, if he has the gift of being able to speak with another language that he himself isn't understanding as he's saying it, he's not going to do it. He's saying, I'm not going to pray. He's not even going to pray. I'm not going to, he's not going to preach. He's not going to pray. I, I, don't, I don't know it at all. The only way I'm going to know this is if someone else knows the, you know, this language, but the, the understanding is completely unfruitful. So I'm going to pray in the Spirit, and I'm going to pray in the understanding. I will sing in the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. And if you think about it, what would be the purpose anyways? If you're praying to God, why would you even want to pray in a different language to God? God understands all languages. So what's the, what's the value? What, what would be better of speaking in some unknown language to you or speaking in a language that you do? You know, it doesn't matter what language you choose. But you ought to understand what you're saying to God. I mean, this is what, what he's preaching here and saying. And teaching against, I mean, this is like everything against the, 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 the so-called modern, you know, tongue-speaking movement. Verse 16, Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen, at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all, yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written with men of other tongues, and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Verse 22 is key. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So he's saying the sign, the tongues, the, be, the gift to be able to speak with other tongues, other languages, it was given for a sign. But the sign wasn't for people who are already believers. It's not for, so you know what that means? Church is a congregation of believers. So when you come together in church, it's not to speak with other tongues. That's not the point. So that gift of speaking with other languages was to be able to reach unbelievers. Because you're reaching them with the gospel. You're reaching them with the word of God. You're trying to communicate with them. And it's a sign for them. So it's even more impactful going, wow, you know my language? And anyone who's learned another language, first of all, will notice that people, by and large, people who speak that language, like I know some Spanish. And when this gringo shows up at the door of a Mexican's house or some other Hispanic person's house, and I'm speaking their native language, they listen to me a lot more. That's right. They give, take a lot more heed to what I'm trying to say to them just because, one, they're, probably, they're a little bit astonished that I'm speaking their language, and they respect that, and they're going to show a little bit more courtesy and listen to what I have to say because I've taken the time and the effort to go and learn their language and, and speak to them in language that they understand. 
And I don't think people are that different today than they ever have been as far as that goes of showing people respect when there's, oh, you're speaking my language. I mean, you see it in the Bible days. We know this is true because when the apostle Paul, Paul spake in the Hebrew tongue, everyone got quiet and listened to what he had to say. Remember all the Jews that were there that wanted to kill him and so on and stuff? He started speaking Hebrew and everyone got real quiet. Oh, he's speaking our language. Let's listen to what he had. And these are people that hated him. And it's because he was speaking their language that they said, oh, okay, hold on a second. We'll listen to this. People do the same thing today. And even if it wasn't because of your own efforts, you know, for me, Spanish, if I had the ability to speak with some other tongue, the people are going to listen more. And that would be a sign to them even more. Be like, where did you learn? Where did you learn to speak Chinese? Right? I'm speaking to a group of Chinese people. I didn't. God's working through me. You know, I mean, that would be a sign for the unbeliever. But I could hear you speak just so well as if you were born in the land. Because that's the power of God. Amen. It's not for unbelievers to come into church and see people shouting gibberish and, and think that that's the, word, you know, the work of God. Because it's not. That's not what it's for. He says, but prophesying serveth not for them that believe not. So just the pre, you know, Bible preaching and stuff. That's why we don't go out. We preach the gospel, which, yes, is Bible preaching. But we don't just go out and just start prophesying and preaching these other doctrines to unsaved people. I'm not going to go and, and teach this sermon on speaking with other tongues, just going out of the church to unbelievers and try to get this across. Even Pentecostals, I don't just go and try to debunk what they believe about speaking with tongues when they're unsaved or because they're unsaved. You know, I go out there and, and try, try to teach them the gospel and show them that, yeah, eternal life is eternal. It's forever. That's what they need to hear, not, uh, not this other prophesying. Verse 23, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? So they're saying, look, if you have this whole church full of people and everyone just speaking with, you know, there's just all this circus going on, aren't they going to say, man, these people are crazy? Yeah. And that's what they do in the Pentecostal churches too. People walk in, they're like, whoa, what's going on here? These people are nuts. Verse 24, but if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. But yeah, someone comes in, they can understand what's being taught, what's being you know, preached, and that there's other people in church. Like here, when people come in, we have visitors come in, anybody pretty much can go and approach that person and, and show them the gospel and be able to, to teach them out of the Bible. Then they're going to get value out of that. They're going to be able to you know, uh, be convinced of all because you're speaking their language. Verse 25, And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. So this falling down on his face and reporting God is in you of a truth does not happen by seeing, oh, wow, all these people are just speaking these weird things and babbling and falling down on the floor and rolling around. And that's not how people are going to see that God is in you of a truth. It's the preaching, it's the prophesying that they're going to say, wow, that makes sense, that's true. This is of God. Verse 26, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying. That's the goal. That's the purpose, right? We're trying to build up other people. That's what the, the house of God is for. That's what the church is for, is for the, the gathering of believers to edify, to build up, to give knowledge and instruction and to help you to grow. Verse 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and let one interpret. So if people are to come up here and, and speak in another language and speak in an unknown tongue to the church, we're going to have an interpreter. And we're not going to have just everybody like, well, I got something to say and 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 just have like open mic night at the church. It's going to be by two or at the most by three. Okay? There's nothing wrong with having multiple preachers in a church service. That's fine, but we're going to do it by two and at the most by three. 
Because it's not just going to be, well, I got, you know, I've got this interpretation. I've got this psalm. I've got this, you know. Hold on. Hold your horses there. And if you're speaking in an unknown tongue, we're going to have an interpreter. Verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, look at this, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Amen. Now what happens in these Pentecostal churches, from what I've heard and what I've seen, is that people just, they'll stand up or they'll be in their seat and they'll go, oh, you know, and just shout up, whatever. And then someone else calls themselves an interpreter and then they'll say, oh yeah, this person said that. But how do you even know in advance? Like, I don't think these people know in advance who's the interpreter. Like, well, is there an interpreter here? Because... You know why? Because they're not in control and they're just spouting off whatever or they're just faking it and making it up just like the interpreter's faking it and making it up. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the real... Um, if you, if you want to, to have the more influential con job in a Pentecostal church, be the interpreter, <laughs> right? See, everyone wants to speak with the tongues because they want to look like, see, look, I'm speaking with other tongues too. But the interpreter just gets to say whatever they want. Oh, yeah, they said this. And they said, you could just teach and preach whatever you want. And no one's going to be the wiser. <laughs> well, I, could, I just have a gift of interpreter. I can't, I can't speak it. You're like, well, why don't you say something to me in that, in that language you just interpreted? Well, I can't. I just have this gift of being able to interpret. <laughs> it's weird. I don't see how people don't see through it. Verse 28, 20, excuse me, 29. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. You know what this means? It's still, again, it just shows order. If there's another preacher in here, which we have preachers, and they, they have it, you know, there's something that, you know what? something, you know, there's something to preach here. There's nothing wrong with that preacher getting up, but you know what? They're going to wait their turn so things can be done decently and in order. And they're not just going to stand up and just like, I'm in the middle of preaching something. And they're just going to be like, and God's, you know, just, just going off on the same point or something and, and coming and just adding their own sermon to the mix. Like, hold on a second. Like, I appreciate you got something to say, but let's wait. And you know, this is also why we do the example with the silent partners where we preach the gospel. Okay, and this, is, and this is a good point for everyone to hear and understand if you haven't heard this before. When we go out and preach the gospel, it's, it's, a, it's a mini sermon. In a sense, it is because you're teaching a truth. You're trying to show people how to be saved from Scripture and you have a plan on where you're going and when you communicate with that person, sometimes that plan may change based on what they say, but you know what you're planning on doing and where you're going to go next. Sometimes you have to set some things up and, and see where they're at here in order to bring them somewhere else. And there's a plan to it, and there's an effective plan to it, which is why we have one person leading the way and guiding it and preaching that sermon of salvation to whoever they're talking to. And that's why we have a silent partner who doesn't interject and just start, hey, this just came to my mind. And look, if you go out soul winning enough, you'll realize you'll have things come to your mind. And things that are helpful things, potentially, that you think you hear that your partner say something and you see their reaction and you're kind of watching the exchange going by and you think, you know what? I think they would benefit from hearing this, right? So there's nothing, I'm not saying there's any bad thing about having that or wanting to, to talk, but the best way to do it is to not interrupt your partner and let them continue with what they're doing and you just hold on to that and bring it up later on if they need it because there's been times and and you know i'm not perfect with this i'm not 100 percent perfect with this i try to be but there's been times where i've held my tongue and then i and then i realized like well they got it and they ended up getting saved i never even needed to interject and if i interject i might just make things more confusing for the person yeah. That's right. you know let the holy spirit work through your partner to give the gospel and if the person doesn't get saved or you still think they could benefit from hearing something, because oftentimes, too, sometimes they'll just bring up what you were going to bring up just a little bit later. Yeah. It's fine. Let them do it. It's better than having this, you know, people, oh, I've got something to say. Let it be done decently and in order. Just as we would in church, we bring that out to the door as well. Um, verse 31 for you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. 
and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. God's not the author of confusion. You know, it's real confusing when you have people just, just spouting off all over the place and who knows what they're saying. That's confusing. Verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches. And again, I mean, as we continue through this chapter, you've been in Pentecostal churches, how many women are standing up and speaking in tongues? It's like, follow. It's probably more than the men. I don't know. I mean, it depends on what church you go to. But you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, like, what about chapter verse 34? Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? Verse 37, and I love that, that, he, that God put this here, because verses 34 and 35 are very controversial and probably always have been to, to, to maybe greater or lesser extents throughout history. But he adds verse 37, says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, look, you think, you think you're religious? You think you're a prophet? You think you're spiritual? You think that? Okay. Let that person, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. You think you're so sweet? Why don't you just acknowledge then when it says, let your women keep silence in the church? That's the words of the Lord. You think you're spiritual? Then you better acknowledge that. Amen. Don't you come telling me you're so spiritual and you're saying, oh yeah, that's not of God. Oh yeah, we don't need to listen to that. Because I don't want to hear it. Because he's saying, you better acknowledge that because you, you can't consider yourself a prophet or spiritual. Unless you acknowledge that those things, the things that he wrote unto the church at Corinth are, the, are of God. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet the prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So, you know, I don't, I don't prevent, I wouldn't prevent someone with a gift of being able to speak with another language or other tongues. I'm not going to forbid that. I'm not going to forbid it in the church. But you know what? If anyone were to ever get that gift, we're going to do things the way that the Bible spells out and they're going to be done decently and in order. And that's the bottom line. It's not, it's not that I'm against people speaking with other languages. We're going to follow God's program. And you know, sometimes it's boring to speak other languages. We do it. I do it when we're out of the doors and someone doesn't speak English and they do speak Spanish. <laughs> otherwise, there's, otherwise, if I speak Spanish to a person that doesn't speak Spanish, it's not going to help them either. Right? And, so like, oh, wait, you're from, you're from Taiwan? Let me speak Spanish to you. <laughs> yeah, they're still not going to understand. It's just the same as English. It's not going to matter. So um, anyways, it's, it's an important doctrine. It's one that, that people take way out of context. But when you, understand, when you just look at the biblical evidence of it and, and what the scripture says about it, it makes perfect sense. Tongues were given for a sign to those that didn't believe. And there's a great opportunity for the, the gospel to get out to the whole world. And, and God used that opportunity by giving people these gifts to speak with other languages. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great truth that you uh, give us in the Bible. I pray that you please help us not to be deceived by those that, that speak guile and lie in wait to deceive and, and try to put on a show of their spirituality as opposed to just using good doctrine and sound speech that cannot be condemned as you've instructed us, Lord. Help us to show discernment, and I pray that you would please give us whatever gifts or abilities we need to do your work, dear Lord, whatever, whatever that is. If you've already given us everything we need, then amen. Uh, we're going to go out and do the work set before us, Lord, and if there's anything lacking from us, we pray that you would please give us all the tools that we need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.